All right, geometry students, uh, one of the final things that we need to do in this particular unit is uh, kind of take a step back away from the solids and uh, the discussions about solids that we've been having for the last couple of weeks and look at what is kind of termed the different geometries. Okay, so uh, basically what we're going to be doing today is uh, all year long we have spent uh, time talking about Euclidean geometry, okay, the geometric world according to Euclid and his books that he wrote that were titled The Elements, okay. However, these are not the only methods of thinking. Uh, Euclid's way of thinking about it was not the only way, uh, especially here in recent um, centuries. Okay, so let's take a look. Our objective for this particular lesson is going to be to recognize the non-Euclidean geometries and their aspects. Now, Euclid did an amazing job uh, with his work on geometry. Okay, you, but Euclid made some assumptions that while they stood strong for a lot of centuries, uh, Euclid's work was back in the in the early uh, the early years of, of AD uh, 200 and 300 AD, and his work stood until the 1700s and 1800s when people started to realize that Euclid's assumptions that everything could be built out of the three basic structures, points and lines and planes, that that assumption was simply not holding up. Okay, so let's take a look here. Of course, Euclidean geometry, as I've already stated, built entirely out of points and lines and planes, that every structure in the geometric world could be built out of points and lines and planes. And it's only been in the last couple of hundred years that his thinking has been kind of undone somewhat. And actually the thing that caused people to start doubting Euclid's uh, assumptions was what has become known as the parallel lines axiom. Okay, now an axiom is, is kind of like uh, a rule uh, that, that kind of governs uh, other rules. It is, it is basically, you know, um, uh, kind of like an, an, an umbrella. It covers a whole bunch of other things. And it was kind of discovered that one of Euclid's uh, ideas uh, in the elements about parallel lines did not hold true on some things. Okay, now Euclid's idea was uh, with the parallel lines was that um, if you had two lines that were intersected by a third line, a transversal, that any angles at those intersections that were either smaller or larger than right angles, meaning they were acute or obtuse, okay, would cause the lines to intersect. Okay, so graphically what Euclid said was if you have two lines like you see there and you pick any point on one of those lines, okay, and then you allow a transversal to pass through that point, thus intersecting both of the lines, and you forced those uh, intersections to be right angles, then that guaranteed the lines would be parallel. Okay, and we should know that as well through our studies of Euclid's uh, geometry. Uh, we are looking at same side interior angles. Same side interior angles are supposed to be supplementary, and they are 90 plus 90 is 180. Okay, and we know that we could move those uh, right angle boxes around, and maybe we'd have corresponding angles or alternate interior. But anyway, no matter what type of angles or where you mark those right angles, we would end up with parallel lines. That's what Euclid said. And in Euclid's world, in his mind, that was correct. However, there have been some recent emergence of different thinking. Okay, so what we're looking at now is called the non-Euclidean geometries. And there are several different types of non-Euclidean geometries. The first one we're going to look at is termed hyperbolic, hyperbolic geometry. 
Okay. And hyperbolic geometry, as well as some of these, these other ones, this is based upon the idea Euclid, his idea of the geometric world was basically on paper. On paper, everything was built out of points and lines and planes, and the three-dimensional world could be built out of these zero, one, and second dimensional items. However, as we know in the real world, our real world is not flat like a piece of paper. However, that paper could be distorted. Okay, so like, for example, this surface, which is kind of like a piece of paper that's just being, you know, folded up or held up in certain places, okay, kind of looks like a, almost like a saddle shape. This is what is called hyperbolic, that particular bend. And if you look at, okay, the uh, shape that's inside of it in there, okay, you've got a three-sided shape. It resembles a triangle. However, due to the nature of the curve on the hyperbolic surface, you can see that our triangle is kind of bending inward. So it's actually causing the lines to kind of try to collapse in toward its, themselves like a concave polygon would. Okay, so what you're looking at on the right is a demonstration of how Euclid's definition of parallel lines fail. We have one line that is crossing two other lines. We have right angles at the intersection, despite the fact that the lines themselves are obviously not parallel to each other. So this was part of Euclid's undoing and a new uh, idea or a new um, discipline of geometry was born, hyperbolic geometry. Okay. On the other hand, you might have the reverse type uh, situation, and uh, this one was termed spherical geometry. Now, as you can imagine, spherical geometry, it was clearly geometry of a sphere, like our planet, as our planet became the source of a lot of disciplinary study. Geometry, of course, started studying the planet as well. And what you end up with in spherical geometry is instead of like with the triangle up above on the hyperbolic geometry, you've got the uh, sides of the triangle kind of uh, sucking in towards the center of the polygon. On a sphere, the same idea is actually going to cause that triangle to bulge outward. So... Um, again, Euclid's definition of parallel lines fails him because you end up with two lines that are both perpendicular to a third line, like you see there on the right, but obviously the lines are not parallel to each other. They're going to intersect on the ends, okay? And so uh, yet another uh, version of geometry was born, spherical geometry. Okay, now the next couple that we're going to look at are much more modern and recent uh, ways of thinking. Okay, this is kind of a, a strange one. I'm not entirely sure I agree with this uh, particular branch of geometry, but it's what's lay in layman's terms, kind of simplistic language, it's referred to as taxi cab geometry. Okay, now... What this is based on is is really kind of a, an oddball way of thinking. Okay, it makes sense, but I'm not real sure it deserves its own branch of geometry just because of this. Okay, let's say we are looking at a map of streets from above, like you're looking at there. Okay, so kind of like downtown, you got this little grid. Okay, in Euclid's perfect world of geometry, okay, you've probably heard this definition before. The shortest distance between any two points is a straight line. Okay, so if you connect the dots, then that is the shortest distance. And we end up with things like the distance formula and the midpoint formula and stuff like that based upon the idea that the shortest distance is a straight line connecting those two points. Now, taxicab geometry explores the possibility that you may not be able to go directly in between those two points, okay? Hence the term 
taxi cab. Let's say you get in a taxi cab at one of these points and are trying to get to the other point. Well, the taxi cab cannot cut through the city blocks and run through buildings, so what it must do is leave one location and drive along the, the uh, avenues that are available to it in order to get from one place to another. Now, obviously, the little trail that I drew right there is not the only possibility. Perhaps instead of going up one block, maybe it goes up two blocks and then over. Or maybe it goes all the way up and then comes across. Or maybe it goes across first and then goes up. And it, uh, in honesty, it does not matter which avenue the taxi cab takes as long as its intention is to get from one point to the other point without doing something crazy such as leaving one destination and then driving out of the way in order to get to the other point. Okay, that's not an example of taxi cab geometry. Taxi cab geometry is the shortest distance along the routes that are available between one point and another. And as long as you follow uh, the idea of trying to get from one point to the other without going out of the way, you end up with the same distance. Now this opens up some very strange ideas when it comes up to, up to the idea of polygons in taxi cab geometry. Okay, so for example, the guy on the left is what we have come to know as a circle. If you remember, a circle is a set of all points that are equidistant from a given point. So if you start off at a certain point, like the center point, and you measure out equal distances, the radii, all different directions, and place points at the end of all those radii, you end up with a circle. Okay. However, the same idea in taxicab geometry would be, hey, I'm going to start out at this point, and then I'm going to reach out that equal distance in all directions, and I'm going to place points at the end of all those. Well, clearly, at the end of all these radii, there are not streets, okay, for lack of a better way of putting it, at those locations. So what we do is at the end of that outward measurement, we place a point as close to that location as we can and still be on the grid. So the, the diagram in the middle there and the one on the right, those would be acceptable examples of the word circle in a uh, the idea of taxi cab geometry. Now, that's a very strange concept, but that's the way that this works. Now, a more mathematical version of geometry has uh, evolved here in recent years, and this one is very good. Euclid's work is good. It does hold its ground. It gets a great amount of our idea of geometry. It gets it defined. But there is a new one called fractal geometry. And this one brings about some very interesting ideas. And basically what we're doing is we're taking uh, Euclid's idea and expanding on it, not changing it, just going, you know what, Euclid did some good things way back then, okay, but we're smarter now. Okay, there are some extra information that Euclid wasn't able to think of, so let's kind of finish Euclid's work for him. And one of the things is going to be the idea of non-integer dimensions. Okay, now in Euclid's world, of course, he defined the zero dimension being the point, the first dimension being the line, the second dimension being the plane, and then if we took all of his information and combined it, then we could generate the third dimension being solids and things like that. Okay, so that's not new to us. We know that. However, if you think about the true nature of the world, there are a lot of things that exist in nature that cannot be defined using just points, lines, planes, and solids using uh, points and lines and planes. 
Okay, so the recent development has been to think, you know what, maybe there is something in between the zero dimension and the first dimension. Maybe there's something in between the first dimension and the second, and so on. Maybe there's something in between the second dimension and the third, and maybe there's even something beyond the third dimension in geometry. Okay, so let's look at some examples of that. Okay. If you think about lines in nature, very seldom are there naturally occurring perfectly straight lines. But if you look around in nature's world, like tree trunks or tree branches or things like that, we have the basic idea of a line, but it's not perfectly straight. It's trying to have only length, but it does have a little width and it does have a little depth going in different directions because it's a little bit wavy. So that suggests that, hey, it wanted to be first dimension, but since it had a little wiggle to it, that kind of have tried to move it towards the second dimension, but it didn't really get there because it's more length than it is width. So a wavy line might be somewhere close to the first dimension, but still in between first dimension and second dimension. And I you probably can't see that image very good, but for those of you that have been to the beach, think about little sand dunes. Okay, you've got basically a flat surface, which is the beach, but due to uh, wind currents and water currents and things like that, you've got basically little waves, little ripples that are running all over the surface of that plane. Well, a plane's only supposed to have two dimensions, length and width. So if that's the case, then how did nature end up with these little ripples sticking up out of that plane? So it suggests that, you know what? Yeah, it's mostly second dimension dimension, but it does kind of tinker with the third dimension. So it doesn't necessarily all fit into just zero dimension, one dimension, two dimensions, and three dimensions. Fractal geometry suggests, you know what, we can kind of figure out where some of this stuff in nature actually fits in in between those dimensions. That's one really cool idea that fractal geometry brings to the table. There is another one that is even kind of uh, more obvious in nature, okay? Uh, and this part of fractal geometry deals with the idea that nature, in a lot of ways, is self-reflective, okay? And what that means is, is that if you look at things that occur naturally in nature, if you were to, like, kind of look at them under a microscope, look at their smaller pieces, that the smaller pieces actually look like the, the big picture, okay? And if you take those small pieces and look at them on an even smaller scale, that the even smaller pieces will look, again, like the overall picture. Now, that's not to say that if you look at, like, your arm under a microscope, you're going to, you know, and when you look in the, in the viewer, you're going to see a whole bunch of little arms that look like your arm. And then if you look at the little arms in the microscope even closer, you're going to see even a whole bunch of smaller little arms. It's not to say things like that. It doesn't work for everything. Thing. Okay, but one thing it does work for is like a fern plant. Okay, if you look at the branches on a fern tree, uh, like over on the left hand side, this is their basic structure. You have a main branch, off of that main branch, smaller branches uh, veer out away from it, and then off of those branches, smaller branches, and you've got the little leaves and so on. But if you take a, a look at maybe just one branch, which is the second picture over from the left, and blow it up and look at it, it looks pretty much exactly like the overall picture of the big branch. And then if you take a small picture of it and blow it up, it looks like the overall branch. And you could continue this idea of going smaller and smaller and smaller, and you keep seeing images that look basically like the structure of the big branch that you started off with. And you see uh, a lot of uh, examples of this in nature, uh, coastlines along the water. Uh, they're not perfect lines. They're, they're jagged when you look at them on a map, but then when you look at them up close, it's still uh, jagged, but in the same basic curvature, and you look at it even closer, still jagged, same basic curvature, curvature. okay, over and over again. So uh, fractal geometry 
one of the things it does is it tries to define this idea of nature being self-reflective. Okay, now that's it. That's all we're really going to do as far as the different geometries are concerned. You just need to be aware that there are different types and what their basic idea is. And of course, understand that it was the parallel lines axiom that was kind of uh, Euclid's undoing. And then understand that you have uh, hyperbolic geometry, spherical geometry, depending on whether the curve is outward or inward. Hyperbolic would be an inward curve, spherical would be an outward curve, and then taxicab geometry, okay, more like geometry on a piece of graph paper rather than in, a, in Euclid's perfect world, and then fractal geometry, uh, dealing with nature being uh, self-reflective and also that uh, the nature does not fit exactly into the dimensions as they are numbered that it is possible to exist in between the dimensions uh, as we saw. Anyway, so there's a little bit of background on some of the other non-Euclidean geometries that are not really the focus of our class, but we are expected to know a little bit about them, so now you do. So add that information to uh, what you need to know for your test, and good luck.